Hello, so this is the fuzzing session, it's the second fuzzing session, sorry, fuzzing session 01 I believe I call it because I write software, I count from zero, and I did something really dumb the last time and I forgot to turn on the microphone recording for the last session, so I'm now having to go back and re-record this entire session, so if I'm not directly interacting with people, you can understand why, my bad. Next time it won't happen, so I apologise if you guys are part of that session and you don't have the exact video that you were expecting to, but I will be caught, you know, covering largely the main sort of things as I go through. So, first things first. Last week we spoke very much about AFL. We had this idea of what we did for instrumented fuzzing, and we sort of set up this notion that you can trace program blocks as they get executed from code not only that with afl you can provide standard input or you can provide a file and then based on the data that's given to a certain program as long as you can run it in a very sort of discretized way what i mean by that is you know you start the process running and then it ends at some point you'll be able to get to the end or it will hang or it will crash and you'll be able to record the exact blocks within memory that the process actually went through and you know the processor actually performed those actions. So I won't describe that again, I won't talk about um, the sort of how it works and what program tracing is. So this week I'm jumping very much into the next sort of phase which is talking about how to integrate these new sort of fuzzing tools or these strategies sort of libfuzzer and hongfuzz but within a sort of continuous integration, continuous development life cycle. So this is where I really believe it starts becoming powerful. So the first thing at first is I'll talk about this idea of using uh, libfuzzer. So we'll just go into libfuzzer first. Um, there we go. And we'll open up the test.cpp file. So this is where I've created the test. So the first thing you'll notice is, one thing I will actually say is this is a compilable file if you did in the right way, a compilable source code file. But what's really interesting you'll notice here is that there is no main function. And that's because what's essentially happened in this context is the main function has been replaced by this function, NLVM fuzzer test one input. Now what I'm going to describe now is I guess a paradigm of sort of fuzzers now and of the future and sort of a way to inject data and do sort of tests on small functions. And this is the way libfuzzer has done it, and this is the way that it's sort of going going to happen the first, like in the future. So a really good, a really good example actually to define this is if anyone's seen me before, and I've you know created a main function, I've got an argument counter, and I've got an argument vector. Right. So as I said last week, the argument counter says how many arguments are actually being passed on the command line, and the argument vector is a pointer of a or a pointer of strings to you know, those actual arguments. So it's a way for to, to take input. But the important thing here is that we define this main function, most typically, and then the compiler and the system, I wouldn't say the compiler, apologies, the loader and the system, will provide these arguments that we can then use to do other things. And I think last week I checked to see if the count of these uh, arguments was less than, was exactly equal to 10, and if it was, it would print something or behave differently. <clears throat> so that was my example, is, you know, we can provide some sort of input, if it matches a you know particular uh, particular sort of <clears throat> expected pattern, it will behave one way. If it matches another pattern, it will behave another way. So that's the big thing I wanted to take away. But one thing I want to say: every time you see this LLVM for a test one input, just think about it like main. You know, this we are writing the LLVM for a test one input. What's the only thing that's been expected by the compiler when we build this is that we've created this function. So as as in the same way that oh, actually I'll go back as in the same way they've got an argument counter argument here, we've also got a data argument here. So we're getting past a bit of data. In the same way we're getting past an argument vector, we're also getting past a size. Now this is really important because before when I said that you had to use AFL for you know either reading in a file or reading in standard input which if you think about it under the hood are largely the same things, it's still, it's still, its only goal really is to get data from some external input and, you know, obviously trace it. So in this circumstance, we have this call function thing here that we're actually really particularly interested in. Let's say this is an XML parsing function because I will go back over that in the in the future and like well in a, in a moment and say this is what we this is a really solid example. But this here is some function that you know me a developer has written and I want to test it. And one way I want to test it is via fuzz testing. 
So what's going to happen? We have the when we define this LLVM fuzzer test for input, the fuzzer is going to give us a buffer of data. A buffer of data is, you know, any random byte of data is generated at the time it's been passed in. So, you know, it can be it can be absolutely no data. It can be a null point. It can be ten thousand A's or you know a myriad of other data. And that data here is going to be given directly to the function underneath called call function. And we also have a size parameter, and the size parameter just says how big that data actually is. Now, the really sort of way, the really important thing I sort of, or the, the really important way I see this working is actually, no, I'll go, I'll actually define this as part of sort of a unit test. So let's say we have a function called int process email, for instance, and you know, we get given an email address. So we have some email, uh, checks the email. So we have some, you know, function that called process email and its job is to you know, take an email address and tell us whether or not it's a correct or valid, but valid email address, whether or not it's invalid. Now, if I'm a developer and I'm writing this process email function and that's my task for the day, the other thing I'm going to want is to write a check process or actually I won't say check, I will say, oops. I will write a, oops, I'm not using Vim correctly. I will write a test process email function. And that again will accept, actually it won't accept anything, but it will return true or false. I'll actually change that to a boolean because that makes more sense. So just to describe again, we've got some sort of email called process email function. It takes in an email address but based on this email address, it will return true, for instance, if it's a valid email address, and false if it's an invalid email address. And when I say valid and invalid, I just mean the structure of it. I don't mean it's going to send an email to check that that is a registered email address, just so that it's checking the structure. So we have this function now, and we're going to call it test process email. So like I said, I'm the developer. My task for the day is to write this process email function. And what I'm going to go and do is I'm going to go write a unit test. So the first thing I will do so I will call a email address, I'll call it a good email, for instance, and I will call it chris at coderlabs.uk, because that's my email address, but I'll also create a, whoops, I believe my keys for Vim are messed up, email one, let's call it bad email one, or zero, and bad email one. And let's go in and actually create a badly formed email address, so you know we'll get rid of the at symbol here, here, maybe we'll include some values that shouldn't be uh, allowed. Next, what it will do is we will call this process email function. Remember, this process email function here is this one here. It's, we're going to pass in an email address, and it's going to tell us whether or not it's a valid email address. Actually, I need to change the type on that, so I've just got that slightly wrong. So we're going to pass in this email address, and it's going to say it's either a valid email address or it's an invalid email address. So first things first, we pass in the good email address. And what we should expect is because good email address here is a valid email address, if, unless anyone finds any issue with that, is that this process email should just return true. It should say, yes, this email address is valid. So what we do is we'll put an if statement around here to check that it's a valid email address. And if it is, it passed. Next, we can do an else if and just say not process email bad email zero. So what this is going to do is if this returns false, then it will call into here, which means that, oh, actually I shouldn't do an L, should I? Uh, makes sense. So we do an if not process email here, we have bad email zero. Bad email zero is this one here. This is a bad email address. So we expect this to return false. And if it returns true, then it should fail and if you know if it returns true then there's something wrong with the original process email function and if that happens then we know there's been there's something gone wrong so we should never expect this to return true so we might include some sort of uh, throw error uh, function here and again we will do the second one for process email one 
so this makes sense. I mean, if I'm like I said before, if I'm the if I'm the guy or you know the person that's writing this process email function, I want to make sure that it actually works and behaves as I believe as I think it is. And the way I can do that is if I pass in a good email address, it should just return and say it's a good email address. If I pass in a bad email address and it returns then I know there's something fundamentally gone wrong with the email address. And because I know there's something fundamentally gone wrong with the email address, I know that for some reason the functionality is broken. And again, I, you know, I have another test. So, you know, I test for this, I test for this. But the really important thing to say is that you can't do this for every single input because there's potentially, you know, depending on how it works exactly, you know, millions, hundreds of billions of different email addresses you can enter or an infinite amount of email addresses you can enter. So this is my unit test. This is the idea that I write this function. I create a test to test this function. Now what happens is when I go to compile this and I send it up to the server for storage or I send it up to GitHub um, to be part of the master branch, that before it gets checked in and before it gets merged, what will happen is it'll go away and it will check this email address and it'll, it'll check this function, run this function, and this function should either return true or return false if, if, the, if the email address is passed or if the test has failed. This works really good for integration. So not only is it when I check it into the, the main branch or the master branch, what's also gonna happen is if this then goes on to be integrated with other software, at the end of it, this will all be integrated together sort of to a production environment. And as part of that, it will go off and do all of these extra checks to make sure that if someone else introduced some sort of functionality, it didn't club a mine and cause some sort of issue. So this is what this is the whole idea of unit testing. If you want to do all these different things to make sure we're not causing a bunch of issues and unit test. The problem is, is that's not really designed to find bugs. I mean, you can argue this till the cows come home. I think it really depends on your perspective. My perspective is it's not really a bug testing cap bug testing thing. It's more like a functionality testing thing. You could argue. I mean, you know, you could argue that, you know, if this accepts a bad email address, it's a bug. But, you know, at this sort of level, functionality is far more important than actually finding bugs. Now, I'm not trying to say that finding, you know, finding bugs isn't important. I'm just saying at this level for this specific use case, this is generally, you know, it's, it's generally for functionality it's to make sure that the, you know, underlying software is behaving in a way that we think it's going to behave. And this is what I sort of... You know, this is, I mean, this is the limitation of unit testing, right? You can only write so many of these. You can write really good ones and, you know, entire testing engineers um, and some even people have been taking this course have made an entire career in this. And it's like, it's a legitimate thing. I'm not trying to say that, you know, that's not useful or you, it's not required, but you've always got this idea that you need to test the code that you write and you need to test it in a correct way. So as part of that, this is what's really good about fuzz testing is you will always need this unit test, but fuzz testing is really good because it complements these, functionality tests because what it does then is it will it will give you the ability to start finding bugs so if this is the unit test what i might have down here is lvm fuzzer test one input is instead of just having the unit tests i could just write uh, process email for instance and i obviously don't need the size the size is only optional so if i do this and i pass in this this bit of data into this process email oops i didn't spell that right so i write it into process email here remember process email takes an email address as a string i'll probably have to do some sort of casting here but it will take it will take in this email address as a string and this data will be passed to this process email address. Now, what we're not doing in this case, and this is why I sort of use that term functionality testing, is we're not testing to see if this any of this data is either valid or invalid, because we don't actually really need to check the return values, like we're not actually that interested. What we are very interested in is, is there a type of email address or type of string I can pass to this function that will either cause an infinite loop and if it causes an infinite loop you know obviously that's an issue will it cause some sort of exception to be raised that we haven't predicted will it cause some sort of bug that we haven't yet seen or will it cause like some sort of crash or remote or potential remote code execution or denial of service bug to be sort of identified but the really important thing about this is we already do this you know developers should already already always be writing good tests for you know different scenarios to make sure that the core functionality works but i also say is you know in this very trivial example we have uh, five lines of code 
and you know we all we do here is we just pass in that data directly into the process email which now gives us the ability to do like really intelligent fuss testing and checking for bugs now like i said previously you can do this for javascript you can do this for python you can do it for java i'm just using c because it's the sort of the easiest language to use at this sort of level and the tools are really well developed but this is a really good way to be able to go through and actually check does not only is this you know function behaving like we expect it to but if after it's been built we run it for say an hour or you know a day is there going to be some sort of bug found now that's really good about this is if you are the developer as writing stuff as part of a continuous development continuous integration life cycle it's a fantastic tool because it allows you to almost offload a huge amount of the bug checking to this this program you don't need to just send your code out there and you get back zero days or you get back reports are saying oh by the way there's a bug you can actually preemptively try and start testing your code now it's not going to find everything it's not perfect but this is a huge capability people should really be taking advantage of and the tools especially in this circumstance with llvm fuzz a test one input this whole sort of programming paradigm or the fuzzing paradigm of using this uh, prototype and, and this sort of method of utilizing these tools is phenomenal for integrating into ci cd pipelines now one really good way that i like prefer this actually so if i just go to my desk is if i'm a developer and i sort of alluded to this before if i'm a developer of a really big sort of project and let's say i've got four well actually five let's say five so i've got four sort of functional component five functional components first one we've got some sort of container that holds all of the uh code and let's just say to make it simple this is some sort of react application we have an email box email box here and let's say that's the thing we're currently fuzzing we have a password box we have a username box and we have a date box so we've got five different sort of identifiable elements here and let's say just for argument's sake these are all written by different developers so that's written by developer one two so this is developer three developer four and developer five what's really good about this whole sort of idea of at least in this sense of you know using a fuzz test or fuzz or fuzzing scenario or fuzzing strategy as part of a unit test is that if i'm developer one and i've written the email processing function all i care about is whether or not my email processing thing actually works is there any bugs within my email thing i don't need to go and worry about what these other guys have done or these other people have done for building their own sort of components i write a un i write my unit email email processing test stuff then what i do is i write my unit test to make sure that at least in a very trivial set of examples it works or doesn't work and then thereafter what i do is i write a fuzzer test case that can go on and maybe fuzz it for a couple of days one day two days and go away and tell me actually is there any bugs likely to occur here and the really good thing about using a sort of fuzzing instrumentation is that i don't actually need to supply all of the data all the time it's going to go through and it's going to be able to generate that those good test cases for me. So this is the idea of using an LVM for a test on input. And as I said before, it's different from AFL because in AFL, if we wanted to pass in this data into, let's say, process email, I've just realized I've spelled that wrong. Process. Oh God, I spelled that even more wrong. If I write process email, if I write process email, then I have some data that I'm going to give into this function. And that's what's really good about it is that I'm just directly passing this in. I don't have to worry about that, all that AFL gubbins. I don't have to load the entire, I don't have to load the entire process. I don't have to find a way to pass in data. I don't have to go and read a file, write some file processing functionality. I don't have to write some standard impact processing functionality. The really good thing here is, is like I've said, I don't need to do all that. And if I'm developer one, I only need to write this fuzzing test harness for my particular email processing uh, function. I don't just need to rely on unit tests to do it all for me. Another point I wanna raise very quickly is the idea of what I will call, I guess, variant analysis or variant fuzzing or differential fuzzing in some way. So this, this sort of type of test isn't about whether or not the underlying algorithm will crash. It's more to do with, can we use 
what I would call very basic fuzz tests where we're just sending blocks of data, is there a way that we can exceed the bounds of the underlying operation? Now, that may sound quite loaded. So what I've done here is I've created some sort of language processor. And the job of this language processor in this instance is let's pretend its job is to read a YouTube comment and that YouTube comment will be rated as zero if there's you know no offensive language within that YouTube comment or nine if it's very offensive and there's a lot of offensive content within that YouTube comment. I mean, this is how YouTube does it. It will try and guess as whether or not you know, a, a comment is a face offensive and it will block it for evaluation if it thinks it is or it isn't. But the problem is, is it can't be perfect for many, many reasons. But let's say we have this function, lang processor, and it goes and gets some comment. I've just made that as data. And it's meant to return a value between zero and nine to say, is it, is it not very offensive or is it very offensive? Now, a really good question to ask is, is there any way that this underlying function here can return a value larger than nine, say, or less than zero? Or is there a way for me to introduce offensive comments into this data that the underlying algorithm will miss and it will ignore? Because there will always be cases of false positives. There'll always be cases of false negatives. So the thing is, is like, can we find as many of those as possible? What's really good about this is we can actually don't need to do just calling the language processor. We can also set some constraints on the surrounding data and check whether or not it can exceed some sort of boundaries. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the language processor data and it's going to return, like I said, a value between 0 and 9. So the first thing we might want to check is we want to process this data if the value is less than 0, that is, it's minus 1, or the language processor data is larger than 9, so over uh, 10 or over, then some sort of error has occurred. So can this ever happen? So we can actually, so we're not actually testing to see is there going to be some sort of hang in the processor? So sorry, is there going to be some sort of hang or infinite loop occurring? There still may well be um, based on this, but that's not what our particular interest is. Our particular interest in here is if I give some data which is representing a, you know, a potentially offensive comment to a language processor, will this language processor ever return a value less than zero or will it ever return a value less than, uh, above uh, 10 or above or above nine? Which means if it does, then something has gone wrong and the language processor isn't performing you know, in the way it's, it's supposed to be or expected. So this is what I would call differential fuzzing is let's say we could write this in this context, but then we start adding constraints to see if it can exceed certain boundaries. So now we're add because we're adding these constraints, we're actually going above and beyond in what we're checking. We're checking to see not only is there some sort of you know crash or infinite loop, but also is there some sort of way that we can fudge this, you know, fudge this underlying functionality to exceed the bounds that it's supposed to. And this is the other sort of way I wanted to highlight it, because this is what you're going to see more in terms of memory safe languages. If you're testing something in Golang, if you're testing in JavaScript, you probably won't expect it to either, you know, either cause a crash. Maybe it will cause an infinite loop. That's still a valid thing. But you also may want to check to see if it's returning less than zero or above nine. A really good example of this is in Solidity contracts for Ethereum. So Ethereum, well, I'd say, sorry, I don't mean to say that. The Ethereum networks, the Ethereum network has this idea that you can process smart contracts and a contract is just whatever you give it. You know, two people have some sort of agreement and the code will guarantee, you know, on the blockchain whether or not it's it's actually been performed correctly. And if it has, then it will exchange money for services. It's a really good, it's a really good way of thinking about it. So in those, you write this, contract in what's the solidity source code now there's been a few times when a i guess coin operator some sort of uh, token operator has actually created a solidity contract with bugs in it if they had fuzzed the contract and tested for things like this is there some data i can put in there that will actually return me infinite money or 10 billion coins if it, you know, if if there's some sort of error, integer overflow or underflow, can that happen? You know, ideally the contract should be checking for it. You shouldn't be able to give me more money than you have, but that doesn't mean that a bug doesn't occur. So what happens in cases like that, and I've used it for, is you can check solidity contracts, do a fuzz test, and check 
does this is the is the logic of this contract or this JavaScript code or this Python code does it exceed the boundaries of what I you know what I expect? And it's not about finding a crash because at the end of the day, if I'm going to go and exploit the Solidity code, I'm probably not going to find some sort of crash. But what you will regularly find is logical errors where you can either give yourself too much money or not enough money, and the same for things like JavaScript. Remember, it's not fuzzing isn't just about checking crashes or infinite loops. You can also use it for what I would call differential analysis. You're checking or constrained analysis. You're checking is there boundaries that can be exceeded or not. And this is the way, like I said, you would use it for JavaScript or something else like that. And a really good example for this is Solidity contracts and people that have actually lost, you know, tens of millions of pounds because their, you know, coin, whatever it was called, has had some sort of error in it. And because it's had an error in it, it's issued too much currency. And by I say too much currency, I mean all of the currency it can ever issue. You've basically made someone a Bitcoin billionaire within half a second, and that's basically crashed the entire network and caused all sorts of hyperinflation. So they had to basically, you know, they had to stop that and basically bankrupted themselves. But this is another really good example of where it can be used. Fuzzing, that is. So the next step is to talk about Hongfuzz. So like I said, LLVM, I'm going to come back out, go into my Hongfuzz directory, I'm going to type make to make sure it's all been built. This is all in with the uh, code I've provided. Just wait for it to build. Um, I believe it's all okay. So I'm going to go into the POCO directory. So POCO is the uh, library I've been attacking as part of sort of t to do the demonstration for Hongfuzz. Now, it's not been attacked before. There's been a few. Well, I mean, it may not have, may have been attacked before. I've not like just looked at any of these potential bugs. They're all Sigbus issues, so I don't think they're anything sort of spectacular. The instructions that seem to get triggered aren't anything interesting. I don't think, but that doesn't mean that this isn't a potential. I guess zero day in some way. I just pretty. I'm pretty likely that it's not, so that's why I'm sharing it, but I can't be 100% sure. So if anyone is able to go through and analyse this code when I provide it, please don't go through and exploit it, and please don't do anything nefarious, because I just don't know. I've sort of given it a quick once over and don't think it's anything bad, any of these bugs, but I can't be 100% sure. So the first thing is with Hongfuzz, you need to go and build the code and you need to compile the code. So Hongfuzz has its own compiler, as I said. So Hongfuzz GCC should be a Clang variant as well. You know, Clang++, the uh, sort of normal compiler set that you would typically find. The instrumentation or the test case I've written here, sorry, is within this XML harness. So if I just turn highlight search on, you can see here we've got LLVM for a test one input. Now what I've done in the make file is I've checked for an if def, and if the if def exists, then it will build it as a fuzz case. If not, it will run it as a main, as you can see here. So by default, when we're running the fuzzer, this will not be built. Only this will be built because I'm specifying the fuzz parameter here. So just ignore everything below this else here and just concentrate on this bit. So again, we have LLVM fuzz test run input. We have the data that's provided to us that we can use to fuzz. And we have the size that's specified. Now what I've done in this case is if we follow data through, we can see data is being created, is being converted to a string, standard string, uh, called XML file. So if we follow this XML file, remember the source of this data, of this XML file string, is that data that's being passed into the function. So we follow this, let's get outside that else file. So we follow this string, then this string is being used to create a POCO XML input source, so it's an input source uh, uh, buffer. So this remember this source is this source here is rendered from this XML file. This XML file is built from the data passed in. So the next thing we do with this source is we actually pass it to this parse function, which has been created from this DOM parser object. So we actually want to test this specific parse function as part of this parser object, which is built from the DOM parser. Sorry, POCO XML parser DOM parser object. Sorry, uh, class builds the object parser, and it has this this parse function. So what it's going to do is it's going to generate a bunch of data. The fuzzer that is is going to generate a bunch of data, and it's going to inject it into this parse function. 
Now I've added a few try and catch statements around here. So the the principle was is that if an exception was thrown from within the library itself, within the XML parsing library, then it is known about. And if it's known about, then it's not necessarily a bug we care about. We want to find those cases that can cause, you know, stack overflow issues that aren't necessarily being caused exceptions and, you know, may cause infinite loops. I've also added a while loop down here to actually go through and sort of pull the XML uh, code out to sort of try and trigger sort of more code coverage. You don't really need to worry about it. The main the main point that I'm saying here is that we're actually causing, uh, we're actually um, doing some parsing, and this parsing data here is actually generated from the source, which was generated from the LLVM fuzzer test one input uh, test case or uh, test harness. Ignore everything in here for the moment. So what I'm going to do is if I have a look in the make file, whereas before we, oh, no, not this one, where is it? I can't remember, I've put it, oh, uh, xml test.make. So this is the make file. So before, whereas I used the clang plus plus and passed the dash f sanitize fuzzer parameter, this time we're using hfuzz, hongfuzz dash clang plus plus. I'm obviously building this particular test harness here. And I've done a bunch of linking against all of the uh, binaries that I care about. So the here is just linking information. We can see within the output directory of POCO, we should have a lib file. And this is a bunch of libraries that, oh sorry, a bunch of shared objects that are built. The shared object we're very interested in is this XML shared object here, which actually links to this. This libxml, libpoco xml shared object is the is the thing that contains the instrumented xml code. But as you can see, you can also attack crypto, data processing, SQLite, JSON web, JSON web tokens, JSON itself, uh, MongoDB, SSL, XML, JSON, zip files. There's a there's a bunch of functions you can go through in here and actually sort of pull stuff out because this is what the poco library is for. Is it gives you access to very lightweight small bits of code that are able to perform sort of functions such as JSON parsing, XML parsing. So as I said, we linked against this here, or we at least specified that in the XML file. So in the XML file, you can see that we have said we're, we're interested in POCO XML. This dash L and dash WL here just tells the compiler where the actual shared object binaries have been output. That's what's really interesting to us. So we've uh, built the code. And we get this two outputs. Just ignore this one here. The main one we're interested in is this fuzz. This is something I've created on the side. We're interested in this dash fuzz here. So if I just have a look back, uh, this will output the... Oh, not this one. This will output, sorry, the XML harness dash fuzz. Ignore this. I've obviously used the wrong, uh, the wrong code. So this is what's being output here, dash XML harness. And I also said we specify the parameter fuzz so we're specifying that we're, we're choosing the fuzz case remember this is code that i've added using the if def uh, of the preprocessor new if def uh, engine and we're outputting this xml harness dash fuzz binary to attack so you know we've now compiled it we can you know recompile it again xml uh, test.make has gone through built it you can see the same commands going out but you know we haven't recreated anything we can try and run the XML harness dash fuzz. And it actually says that it's not going to be able to fuzz. Now, this is where I say that Hong fuzz is sort of a bit in the middle of the road between libfuzzer and AFL. So AFL, I always see it as more of a... I guess I see AFL more as a, I guess, a hacker's tool, some sort of thing you can use to do vulnerability research. It works really well in really difficult environments. It's slower for, well, it's typically slower for many reasons, unless you use like the persistence modes on it. And that's because you have to load the entire binary up. Now you have things like fork servers, which increase the speed, but essentially you have to load the whole binary up. And in particular, when you're doing emulated fuzzing using QMU, which I will describe in a couple of weeks time, you're able to see actually it's the, the difference is here that X AFL is more built from the perspective that it's not integrating into the sort of continuous integration, continuous de development lifecycle. Even though you can, you, you know, you can use that tool as well. But this is what I mean. So whereas we actually use the LLVM for the test one input paradigm here, 
unlike libfuzzer that directly outputs a binary we can run, this time we actually have to specify hongfuzz. Uh, I'm spelled hongfuzz wrong. We actually have to specify hongfuzz. We're going to pass it dash capital P to tell it that it is a persistent binary. We also pass dash Z to say that it's instrumented. Now, this is because hongfuzz has a lot more parameters you can pass. You can use it in, in, in many more ways. I just use these by default here, just to just to demonstrate. We also pass it an input file. So uh, in file, I believe, infus, yeah. So within infus, there is a. Well, the the main one is there is an XML file that I have just copied from somewhere that it's going to go in and fuzz. Then finally, after all that, exactly the same, almost exactly the same as what you know what you do with AFL. If you should remember last week. Um, I can specify this. So whereas with libfuzzer we just run the binary like this directly because it actually compiled everything together. This time we actually just have to say, you know, hongfuzz, go and grab the input files from this directory, you know, pass some parameters to say it's been persistence mode, it's in instrumented mode, and then we just run the binary. Even though, obviously, I've done something wrong. What's it moaning about? I bet someone has just watching the screen seen what I've done wrong. I know exactly what I've done wrong. I put dash in for some reason, dash i. So there we go, Hongfuzz is now running. So this has actually found some interesting bugs. So it's not said they're no unique because I already had the crash files. But so far it's found 70, 80 crashes, 90 crashes. Now, these are all the same SIG buses. And I'm not entirely sure what they are or how they're working. So like I said, just be careful. But this is what Hongfuzz looks like. It's going through, telling you the iterations... It's telling you the target we're attacking. It's giving you some instrumentation about how long it's taken to do a run through and how many new code paths and sort of the strategies it's, it's taking. I'm not going to describe all of them because it would just be very involved. You can look up a guide on how to interpret these results. But I just wanted to show you or demonstrate to you this is how you run Hongfuzz. And the idea was exactly the same as what we did with that initial test case or that initial test harness. You just write that LLVM for a test one input. You use that to go and build the code. You instrument the underlying library using by building it with HFuzz. And then once it's been built, you can then build your own test harness around it, which is fairly simple. You know, think about if this was AFL, we'd have to do all of that and then go build another binary to read in a file or read in standard input and parse it that way. Now, while it does work largely the same, HongFuzz uses LLVM Fuzz test run input by default, which is really nice. Um, I don't actually know if this is the case with AFL++ unless they've modded it in some way, but when certainly when I was using AFL a couple of years ago, definitely wasn't there yet. Anyway, this is, uh, this is how we use AFL. So this has generated some files here. So we can have a look at Sigbus. What's really interesting, actually, I really like about this about uh, Hungfus is this says where your program, uh, your, your PC, what was your program controller, or program counter, shall I say. This, so this is where the, the code actually stopped within the binary. Obviously, this looks like it's been loaded on the, not, I wouldn't say stack, but it's been loaded somewhere in memory. Uh, this is what the stack is. The code instrument so this is the actual the instruction so this is the actual instruction that's causing the issue um it seems to be when we're doing a extended move from the ymm register now if you don't know what a ymm register is the intel has a bunch of sse instructions with ssa2 and a bunch of other stuff but basically to allow the transfer of data over 64 bit long so over 64 bit registers you have a XMM register, which is 128 bits, a 256 register, which is YMM, and a 512 register, which is ZMM. Now, it's nice. Those These are a lot nicer because what it lets you do is instead of having to move around data in 64-bit chunks, you can move something in one instruction with maybe you know two or three clock cycles in one go from between 512 bits 512 bits so really it works really well when you're doing a lot of floating point operations when you're doing a lot of sort of i guess things like loading keys in and out of memory for different processes but if you need to move around large chunks of data within register like to do within registers it's much faster so this is what it says here which is really nice um so yeah that's generally how hong fuzz works you can have a look at this code so i will just have a quick look Two two is it five five I believe uh, three zero oh god I can't see where I'm looking three 
Let's just one zero six. Okay, let's look at this. So this is the actual XML file that's changed somehow. Um, we can just go to the end. We can see that it's cut the XML file short for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, but there is likely some data in here that when it's changed, and you'll have to do a differential comparison between the original XML file and this XML file to see what's changed. And based on what's changed, you can actually say, look, say for instance, you know, if I include a P in this exact location in the file, it will cause some sort of SIG bus crash for some reason. I don't know why, that's all down to triaging. The point was is to say that you know Hongfuzz is this very powerful tool which can make use of the LLVM for the test run input interface, but also doesn't do things like crashes when, or sorry, exits when uh, the underlying process crashes. So this is why I say it's sort of an in between between you know libfuzzer and AFL. You know, is sort of a general, generally speaking. But it's nice because you can in integrate all of these things quite well into fuzzing environments. And just be able to use this as a, as a really good way to go through and prevent bugs and zero days from actually making it out there. So I really encourage people to go away and actually build stuff with this. The next thing I will talk about is to discuss a bit uh, with just involving how uh, how like symbols actually work in binaries because not many people know this. So if I just go to, if I just write a quick bit of code, so if I just write test C, for instance, and I write, just say, oops, include stdio.h, int main, int argc, char argv, uh, just do print f hello, for instance. And then we'll just return zero and just build this. Cool. So we have a... Oh, is this here? I thought I'd do this in temp. Maybe not, we'll just do it here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build this test file, which should just print uh, hello. And I'm just going to build it to test. So just run test, obviously it prints alone. What we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to have a look at the elf header. So if anyone's ever read a or looked at a PNG file, PNGs are really good examples. So if I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just look for a .png file somewhere. I'm just going to grab a random one. If anyone's ever had a look at PNG, so I'll just copy that and put it uh, put it here. So we can have a look at this. We can run file on it, have a look at it closely. And when we run file on the PNG file, it says it's PNG data. So what we're going to do now is we're going to change it. I'm going to change it to the file, but without the PNG data. So if we run the file again on this file, this PNG file, the, the tool still is able, even though we don't have the extension, so we got rid of the extension there, even though we don't have the extension, it can still tell it's a PNG file. What's nice about this is we can actually have a look at the data within Hexdump. So it was a bit bigger than I thought it would be. So what we can see here in Hexdump is at the string at the beginning, so the four characters at the beginning, actually spells out png so what file is doing here the file tool is it's going through and it's reading that first four bytes or first eight bytes whatever it is and it's actually picking up whether or not it's an xml file sorry a png file and it's able to do that because there are these very standardized formats for the well these are called headers because they start at the beginning these standardized formats which allow people to go through and allow tools to actually start reading out data which is really 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 nice so we can also do this with binary files. So we use this test file. So we can also do this with test. If we read this test file, let us see, uh, uh, test, and we just grab the first header of it. What you will see is much like the PNG file had a PNG at the start, this, this file, this executable, has an ELF file at the beginning. And Windows files have the same thing. Uh, Mac files have the same things, firmware files have the same things. They'll all have some sort of header that sort of sits in this location that has some sort of meaning to the programs or to the humans. And what's really nice about this is there is a tool called Read Elf that's able to read the header files. So we have this binary here. 
that we've just printed out all the raw data for. So we can actually see it's got this ELF here, which stands for executable and linking format. But also we can interpret what all of these bits and bytes mean here by using this read ELF dash H. Dash H just says go and read the header. And we can see here this is the magic again, so which means that this is the magic up here. And we can see 7F, 7F, 45, 45, 4C, 4C, 46, 00, etc. And we can go through and we know that this is actually the header file. And this is what tells us whether or not this is a L file. What's more important here is that we see this entry point address. Now entry point address is going to be the first location that the binary jumps to when we... Uh, the binary, sorry, when we when the binary starts, when the operating system loads, it's going to be the first place the operating system jumps to. Now I can actually just draw this to sort of make it a bit clearer for you. So if I just go here, I'm going to remember these values because they're important. So we've got some sort of binary here. This is our binary, and we've got a header. So this is a header, and this is where all that nice information is. What you know, if it's an L file or not, we know whether or not it's 64 bit, if it's you know, what, what you know, what the flags are, there's a bunch of stuff here. And we have the entry point, the entry point is for ours is 0, uh, 01060. So this is the hex address. And this, let's just say, this point's somewhere in the binary. Remember, this is a binary, so this point's down here in this binary. It turns out that you know there's some code here, and this is this is our you know entry function. Now the thing is to realise, and this is a binary, right? The thing the thing to realise is this is just some file. There is fundamentally no difference from this file and a JPEG file and a text file. It, the difference is, or only, is that this here has different bytes in different areas, which changes the meaning of what this actually is. And as I said, one of the things in here. That you can read out is the entry point and I told you when I read on screen that this entry point is 0, uh, 01060 that's the important bit and that comes out of this top here so what we're going to do is we're going to actually trace this we're going to remember this the next thing we're going to check first as well is we're going to remember this but also the one thing I will say is too is that the end of this is like is going to stay the same but the beginning of all of this here including this one will probably be clobbered because of something called address space layout randomization now i won't go into the exact technical details about that it's not too confusing to understand especially after next week's lecture you'll this will make a lot more sense but it's a, it's a security feature it's a way that sort of modern day binaries and systems are able to protect themselves against hackers it can be bypassed it can be bypassed is the one thing i'll say so i'm going to copy this and then I'm going to run the test binary. And I'm going to set a breakpoint. Oh, actually, no, that's that's bad. So I'm going to set a breakpoint on main. And I'm going to set a breakpoint on start. What's interesting here, if I just zoom in a bit, is that if you see the entry point address here, our main function is at 0x1149. But our entry point address is at 0 one six zero what's interesting about this is it shows that the first thing that gets run in a binary is not main main is just a complete convention made up by humans for humans it's there so the compiler can recognize it but fundamentally when the pro, pro the program and the processor actually sees this it doesn't care about what the name of this this symbol is it only cares about that this is this address so what i'm going to do is i'm going to run run this program uh, let me just change the layout to ASM of course we can actually see the layout uh, and what we're seeing here is that we've put a breakpoint remember I said that the we put a breakpoint here sorry and remember that we've said that all of this data can change so this is that zero one zero six zero but at, at you know position independent code and you know ASLR has clobbered it and what's happened is this is actually the start function now, what's really interesting here, if I just put another breakpoint on libc start main. So we'll do this, and then we'll just step and continue through this code. So this code is now running, but we're in the start symbol. And then we've hit this thing called libc start main. What's really interesting about this is if you remember that we had, is it 1149 was the start, was the main address. This libc start main here this is the prototype for that function, much in the same way that we had int uh, main int argc, for instance, uh, char argv. 
that's the function prototype. This time we have some function called libc start main and the first argument passed to it is literally the value main. So we can actually have a look at this. So I'll just copy that. But also you can see the first argument passed in is argc, the second argument is argv. Much like what I've been showing you before, this function here, its job is to start the main function, which is our function, and then pass in parameters that we're interested in. So I'm going to continue this, and we eventually hit main. So this is the actual code in main that we've written. And this is the same value I've copied, which is the same value there. You can verify that. But the one thing that this shows is that the first thing to run in, you know, when a binary starts up is not the main function. So if I just switch back to my desk, we also have some main function in here, which was ended in 49, 0x49. And this, you know, this main function also exists somewhere in this binary. So this binary will be, let's say this points to here. This is where main starts. So what I've shown you before is that when you have this entry point, the first thing that happens is the operating system comes along, says, oh, this file's a binary, reads this header, make sure it's a binary, loads it into memory in the correct places based on the information within this header and sort of dotted around within the tables, loads it into the binary and then jumps to the entry point. Now, as part of this entry point, what happens is this will go and load a bunch of other libraries and a bunch of other binaries, uh, dot shared object files, for instance, and it will pull these in to the memory space. When it's pulled into the memory space, this is able to jump to libc. One of the functions in question was libc start main that I demonstrated before. And its job here is to grab the environment of the operating system and then eventually call into main. Now, I've been very careful with my words over the last few weeks. Because every time I've mentioned main, I've said main is the first area that, or the first bit of the program that the human is the one that's written that the compiler calls into. I've never said that it's the start of the program. It never is the start of the program. It's the first place that the uh, that gets called in for the human code, which is a really good way to look at it. So what we've seen here is this libc start main is able to load main, pass in a bunch of arguments, and then we're able to actually run main. Now that's really interesting because we didn't write the you know start, we didn't write the start symbol. We didn't write the start symbol. And we didn't write the libc start symbol. So where did they come from? Well, it turns out, let's just draw our binary here on the small scale. This is our binary. Something comes along and tacks on some code at the beginning and some code at the end. And this thing that comes along and does this is called libc. Its job is to not only provide a bunch of functions such as printf or malloc or sort of other code, its job is also to tack on the start point, the entry point, and to have hands all the exit routines because you know we need a clean way to enter the processor, but we also need a clean way to exit the processor. Remember, this is our binary in the middle. So when we you know when we write all of our source code in our nice sort of clean text, this actually only really goes into building this sort of um, you know darky black bit of the, the starts, this brown bit here. This goes in and, and, and actually builds this, but libc also comes along and tacks on these two things at the front. But at the same time, we also have a shared object that lives in memory that's able to go through and grab functions out of it that will allow us to go through and call functions. So if I, one thing that people may not know about Linux systems is if I just run this this program here is you will see this will say what shared objects have been loaded into the memory space for this particular binary. So we we have Linux VDSO, which is a call for, well a wrapper into a quick access wrapper into the Linux kernel. We have LD Linux, which is the dynamic loader, but also we have libc, and libc will pretty much always get loaded onto every single binary, or should generally get loaded into every single binary that runs on a Linux process. Another thing to note is that you can see these addresses changing. These addresses are changing because of address space layout randomization. Another thing I sort of wanted to go into, uh, sort of into very, very quickly was to show people the LD preload trick that you can do. So, like I said before, with you know, with um, LLVM fuzzer test for input, I just wanted to highlight the fact that 
you don't actually need you don't actually need to have a main symbol within the binary to actually run as a binary you can actually add your own and you know in the case of LLVM for a test run input we added our own which was LLVM for a test run input we didn't have main because you know you don't need it what what happens in that case is much like I described with start and libc is the 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 compiler goes in and adds that in for you which is really 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 nice so this part here I'm going to show you something separate now I'm going to show you a little sort of trick for injecting code um, What's really nice about this, so you can, if, if you don't have access to an underlying binary, but you can access the library, you can actually start injecting yourself within the code of uh, the the library. You can overwrite function calls that get um, that get called. We used to call too many times. So what I've done here, just let's just do a demonstration. It's probably used to do a demonstration. So we've got a main function that I've created. Remember, again, main is not the first function that gets called and it's also not necessarily have to be in the binary but we've created a main function we also have a printf function which again is a is a function for within libc that gets imported and we have a another function i've called called function so if we just make this we have a main and as you can see this called function here gets prints out in main and then this called function gets called, but passes this string called called from main. If I now come in here, have a look at the libc, we can see that we've got called function, it gets a char message passed in, so a character message, and it then prints out the string message. So it basically does nothing else but you know a printf and just includes that. So just, all it does, we pass this, this string in here, and this function called function just prints it out. Seems really trivial, but I just wanted to use it to show a, show an interesting trick. Let's get rid of that. Oops. But, you know, as by default, we have run this main, which is nice. We can also inspect the libraries for main. What's interesting about the libraries for main is it also uses this lib.shared lib object, which is in the current directory shared as the shared object. So if we have a look here, we have this lib lib .shared object. We can also uh, investigate the symbols. So we can investigate lib lib symbols. And we should see a called function symbol in here somewhere. So we can see the called function is in there. It's at offset 11119 into the library. But we can see that this main function here, when it gets built, it loads this library up into its memory space. And then it jumps into this lib lib uh, .shared object for the sake of calling this one function that just prints a message out. What's really interesting now is that I've also created a separate function here. So I've also called it called function, but this time I've printed something which says called intercepted called from main. And also this takes a message, but we also now we say and hooked this string. So we've now said not only have we intercepted this, uh, in, we intercepted this call. We've also said that, look, we've hooked this call, we've hooked this string. So what I'm going to do is, like, again, I've not recompiled everything, just for the sake of it, but I've also, you know, built this lib hook. So actually, if I just demonstrate that as well, just for, just to make it very clear. So lib hook also has called function. It's at a different memory address. It's an important thing to know. LDD, if I look at that, this binary here, main, still loads this lib shared, lib lib shared object here, this lib lib shared object here, it's got nothing to do with this. So remember, this lib here has built this lib lib shared object, this hook here has built this lib hook shared object, and this main only loads data from here, right? So this main here only loads data and only calls into the shared object library. Just that's one really important aspect that people need to understand. This has got nothing nothing to do with it. The only different, the only relation between this lib lib shared object and this lib object look lib hook hook shared object is that they've both got a function called called function within it. And I've demonstrated that with the read elf property when I was just pulling out the symbols. However, there is a neat little trick within Linux called LD preload. Now what LD preload does is when I run any binary, it's going to say, oh, I need to put shared object, when it goes to load any binary, after I've called this, or I've set this as a parameter, is that main will now first load this libhook.sharedobject, 
and it will look to see if it can resolve, resolve any symbols from this libhook shared object. And then, even though it's hard-coded, it will load this lib lib shared object. Now, what's really important here is that libhook.so does actually have one of the symbols that main is looking for, and that main is called function. And as, you, as I demonstrated before with this function here, is we've actually overwritten it within this hook.c library, or this hook.c code. So if I can set ld preload, this is just an environmental variable, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't stick around unless you force it to. And then I run main, instead of having our usual main, what's happened is we've both started within the main object, the main function, and then we've called from main into that original binary, but this time we've actually intercepted the call, and then we've hooked it. So this is a really good way that if you want to go in without using ptrace and doing anything nasty, and there is a few very, very good uses for this, but you can actually go through and start intercepting the objects and functions as they get called if they go and load from a different direction. It's a bit like, I would say, DLL hijacking within Windows. Um, in a way, it's like sort of a forced way of doing it. You can still do it in Windows. You can use you can DLL hijacking or shared object hijacking also exists in Linux, but LD preload is a way to force, remember, this main binary to search this libhook shared object that I've specified here before this lib lib shared object, even though it's specified here. And it's just a really nice way that if you need to call in or have some sort of functionality grabbed, grabbed out of the binary, it's a very easy way to go through and uh, intercept calls and sort of do some more advanced sort of analysis. But those are the two things I wanted to demonstrate in this class as well. Remember, the first thing being that, you know, we don't actually have to have a main function, you know, a main symbol. It's only there for our convenience. It's there for the compiler convenience. This is what, what really, what's expected for um, when we use something like libfuzzer, libfuzzer is a really good demonstration for this so what I can do is if I just type make because I can just copy this out so I just type make let's go grab clang here uh, actually this test cpp got this test cpp and what I'm going to do this time is I'm just going to get rid of this fuzzer option so I need to get rid of this fuzzer option and I build it and what it's saying is there's no reference to main because clang by default is looking for a main symbol within test cpp however if I've used that LLVM fuzzer test run input and I just type fuzzer, if that LLVM fuzzer test run input is defined, it's going to go through and build it nicely. What I can do as well to demonstrate this further is to go back into that test.cpp file. Uh, can't type test cpp. And I can change, let's just take one character out just to make it easy. And I can rebuild this with the fuzzer. Remember, this time I've also got the fuzzer enabled, so this isn't going to be looking for main, it's going to be looking for LLVM fuzzer test when input. This time it says LLVM fuzzer test when input not found. And that's because what's happened under the hood is we've essentially replaced the main function with LLVM fuzzer test when input. And what I wanted to demonstrate as well is that the fact that we do this is completely arbitrary. Under the hood, after the compiler's done with it, it these just can look like memory addresses to the computer. The, the computer doesn't care, it just jumps to functions. So the libfuzzer team have made this uh, the first function that you, we as humans actually need to write that actually gets called into us, and it's entirely arbitrary. And this is, and this is just really, I really wanted to highlight this point, and this is how the compiler works.